acknowledging the many ways these nations have created, shaped, and served the value of relationship and connection. I really invite you to share in my gratitude for the opportunity to live, work, and of course, learn, uh, and most importantly, gather in good relations with one another today on these lands, and particularly for a beautiful panel discussion. My name is Anna Mullins, and I am a student in the Master of Arts in Professional Communications program. There's been a few of us kicking around today, and I will be your host for this exciting discussion, part of an ongoing webinar series entitled Leadership, Sport, and Social Change. This series critically examines how leadership, communication, and sport intersect to influence our culture, and it aims to shed light on the ways that sport can lead us, uh, and more importantly, the ways we can lead through sport. We are very, very lucky today to be in the virtual audience for episode 13 of the series entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Sport, moderated by the amazing Dr. Jennifer Walinga, who I will bring on momentarily so she can introduce you to the other panelists. But before I do that, a few brief housekeeping notes for everybody. The session will be approximately 90 minutes today. We're very fortunate to have a, a vast amount of time to spend with our panelists. And we will try to use the last 15 minutes for questions. During the session, I will be off stage and off camera, but I won't be disappearing. I will be gathering with the Royal Roads Conference team backstage, gathering questions that you pose in the chat throughout the discussion. So please do participate in that as well. It helps make our virtual environment really dynamic and interactive. And where possible, I think Dr. Walingo may even bring them forward live during the dialogue as well. So don't be shy. If there are other questions left near the end of the session, I will come back on camera and then I will bring them forward there as well. We will try not to forget about you. Uh, so let's begin. Let's begin. A former member of Canada's Commonwealth, World, and Olympic gold medal rowing teams, Dr. Jennifer Walinga blends organizational, educational, and sport theories in designing communication change, and performance interventions in organizations. She is also an award-winning researcher, focusing all of her projects on the central theme of optimal human performance, and is currently working on culture-building projects in the spheres of sport, women in leadership, and workplace health. She is a mother of three, an active member of the athletic and educational communities in Victoria, and also a professor at Royal Roads University, who I've had the privilege of learning from. Dr. Walinga, take it away. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. What a great introduction. Thanks so much for hosting us and welcoming everybody to this uh, webinar. It's great to be part of the grander conference, our, our communication and ethics conference. Uh, I think this is the well, it's becoming a it's becoming an actual ritual, isn't it? That we're going to have every year a tradition. So, looking forward to that. And uh, I'm hearing great things about the sessions all day. I've been poking in here and there as I can. And I want to uh, welcome you to our session, which is all around uh, inclusivity, equity, diversity. And I have a great panel, but I'm just going to share my um, my screen and give you a little bit of an introduction to the webinar to begin with and this episode, and then I will introduce our fabulous panelists that you can see across the top of your screen. Great to see lots of friends uh, in the participant list, and I've been interacting with people in chat, which has been great fun. So let's get started. This is episode 13. Uh, it's lucky episode 13, and we are tackling this topic from another perspective, we've actually had this topic circulating within the webinar series several times, and you can have a look at those on our YouTube channel where you have the whole series of episodes. Today, we'll be focusing on inclusivity, equity, diversity in and through sport. So what are the challenges within sport that we're tackling? And then how could we do a better job of leveraging sport, of people moving through sport, being able to learn how to be more inclusive, equitable, and uh, embrace diversity. 
I'm coming to you from the lands of the Kwisatzem and Lekwungen people, also known as Asanghis and Esquimalt First Nations communities. I'm actually in my little office at home, but I live on the same lands as we uh, operate on out at the campus at Royal Roads University. And if you've never been there, please come. I try to weave in some photos of, uh, of that land, of that location. We lean on our land hugely and for good reason. We also take it, uh, take it very seriously, our responsibility to, to work towards truth, reconciliation, remain open to suggestions and consultations with our Indigenous partners and, uh, and learn how we can balance power within our organization and restore that balance and heal and be true partners as we move forward. I spent a lot of time on Elk Lake as well, which is on the Wasanich territory, and uh, just trying to share that that love of sport. And I'll be asking our panelists a little bit about that as well. You know, what what really has drawn them into the sport context, and and how do they find themselves serving sport continuously into their lives? Here we are on railroads campus and walking down pathways. As I mentioned, we try to learn from nature, and I know through sport we do the same. We're often operating out in nature and uh, having to cooperate, collaborate with it. I love to share this metaphor as well that is part of my school that I operate within, which is communication and culture and the importance of a bridge. I think, again, very important in sport in that we're often taught to embrace diversity mind before you try to bridge the gap. So the idea of getting to know diverse perspectives and opinions before you try to uh, operate together, right? Welcome that diversity in and you will actually probably leverage it more effectively and operate more collaboratively as a team. We also have uh, lots of opportunities through our model, through our flexible admission policy that uh, accepts and embraces athletes into our, into our programs and acknowledges the learning that they've gained through sport. I just made a post on on social the other day about the how important sport is as an educational experience and that's been one of our topics as well but uh you can you can you'll be linked up with me as the liaison here at RRU if you're an athlete interested in exploring our programs I'll show you how you can distill the learning from sport and apply that as credit to the program that you are trying to enter into uh, this is part of a series as I mentioned and these are these three kids I'm a mother of. Just always like to weave those into my, my PowerPoints as well. Sport is a powerful experience, a powerful environment, a powerful concept for society. In, in my view, as a 57-year-old, I have learned to, well, I love sport, and I've learned to appreciate it increasingly over my long life and my long, rich life through sport. Uh, it has so much to teach us. Uh, when it's operating at its best and delivered at its best about development of humans and society about diversity and inclusion and, and the power of embracing diversity of education and learning constantly striving to be better the environment and appreciation i know every time on the lake my, I'm, my mind blows especially because i'm not as fixated on you know going as fast as i possibly can in a boat backwards i sometimes actually look around now at my age and enjoy the environment and appreciate, and it's always teaching me something. It's about equity and human rights, that everybody should have access to these experiences, of course. And why wouldn't we want to share uh, the, the health, of course, the link between sport and health, and, and in many ways, not just the physical health, but the mental health and the emotional health that can be developed through a sport experience, a positive sport experience. Communication and the role that communication plays within sport and the role that sport can play uh, through media, through various kinds of media to communicate certain messages and teachings. And of course, peace, the whole concept of uh, the Olympic principles of friendship, respect and excellence is about that, is about bringing the whole world together and competing with each other, not always about dominating or destroying one another, definitely. We need our competitors. We are uh, definitely collaborative in the sport environment. And sport has shown itself to have so much power. Uh, I just spoke with some high school students in the sports school here in Victoria and reminded them of, of the platform that they will 
that they have, and it will continue to become a very strong platform that they can uh, speak from and be real leaders as they stand on that platform within sport and look to these other models we've seen through the Olympics and other you know, professional sports as well, speaking out for, for important causes in the world and truly being uh, leaders, taking that as a responsibility that you do have because you have a platform and that platform's increasing in size and opportunity every year. Even between 2016 Olympics and the 2020, I noticed a huge increase in the amount of uh, access the athletes had to to different media channels and uh, their voice is very loud and clear and I'm so proud of them for the messages that they've been teaching us. So welcome to episode 13 and now I get to introduce our fantastic panel and I'll start at the top left here with Ghislaine Demers who's a professor at Laval University and also president of EGAL Action and one of the co-directors of the Canadian Research Centre on Gender and Equity in Sport e-Alliance. What a fabulous team of women that she works with. Andrew Paris, coaching lead for equity, diversity, inclusion, and mentorship through the Canadian Sports Centre Atlantic. And Andrew and I are working together on leadership development with uh, a team, a cohort of fantastic leaders across the Atlantic region. Andrea Carey and I go way back. She's the founder and chief inclusion officer, love that title, for Inclusion Incorporated. And uh, check out her webinar as well. She has a fabulous guest, uh, including Ghislaine, and, uh, and has lots to teach us about the work that she's doing in the world. And finally, Quebec Weston, a fellow rower and Olympian. She is now a physiotherapist, but also an, a strong advocate for diversity in sport. And it's so wonderful to welcome her in. She uh, is from a, a different generation in rowing, clearly. And I, I just love the work that she's doing and the messages that she's shared about representation. And so now what I'll do is pause my, uh, my PowerPoint, but I also want to remind you that you can pose questions in the chat and uh, I'll try to track them, but I also have Anna's help there. And, and I find the panelists kind of start reading the chat as well. And, and all those questions and comments flow into our discussion. It'll be very, very much a discussion format. So please weigh in with comments and questions. Um, at the end, we'll, we'll structure maybe a more formal 15 minutes or so of question and answer where you can turn your mic on as well and pose a question. Just put your hand up and we'll know you'd like to share. <laughs> and Anna says, you bet I'm here for you, Dr. Willink. I love it. Dr. J, people call me sometimes, so funny. I used to play basketball, so I really love that, even though I'm sure I'm not very good anymore. Definitely couldn't hit a three. Um, and then our next episode, actually, we are working on. So I'm just holding that in a, as a placeholder for now. I've got perhaps Duff Gibson coming in. I might have a one-on-one -on -one with him. All right, so let's end uh, the, the show here and get out of here and see these fantastic faces and let's get started. So I'd like to start with a question, that question I always ask, and I've had lots of feedback that people actually really appreciate this one. And they like hearing from the panelists on why sport? Why are you, why did you uh, get drawn to sport? Why are you still? I think I got muted as I came back in, sorry. <laughs> So great to see all these faces. I start with a question that uh, people love, which is all about what drew you to sport and why you're still in the sports space. What, what's important to you about sport? And so typically people will just turn on their mic and then I know you're ready and I can invite you into the conversation. As we go, I welcome you to just leave your mics on and, and poke in because it really is a group discussion, right? Okay, who would like to go first? I can. Thank you. The, the francophone one. <laughs> um, well, why sport? I think uh, the first reason is because when I started sport, it was fun. So I had fun. I was with friends. That was the first thing why I got involved in sport. And then the more I played, uh, the more I enjoyed myself. And then the competitive side of it came in and it was great just to improve yourself, uh, working with other peers and, you know, working together towards the same goal, experiencing high and lows together. And, and you learn so much about yourself and about others. And I think uh, uh, you, you learn how life is, how life is like, I mean, sport is life. So for me, it was a great uh, live school, if I can say that. Love it. Thank you. Sport is life. 
I feel like I've heard that somewhere else. <laughs> and next, great, Kubet. Yeah, so I, I think sport for me has been something that from, from the very start of my story has been important. So I was born in, in Nigeria and, and to an interracial couple. And when I moved back to Canada, I moved back to my mom's hometown. And our family was the only non-white family in a small rural town in Ontario. And I think at that time, you know, I, I felt that a lot of my story, people presumed just from the way I looked and from the color of my skin. And for me, sport allowed me to stand out for something other than that and to really stand out for something that I had some control over and that I could um, have fun with and also strive for success and strive for belonging and strive for connection in the community. And I think that's what, um, you know, when I looked at being part of the fabric of Canada, wanting to stand on the podium and represent Canada was really important to me. And that was something that um, when I look at my high journey, that was always the goal. And then more recently, sort of looking at all the things that sport has given me outside of being able to compete for Canada, all the connections that I've made, the doors that I've opened, the opportunities for travel, the understanding of myself and the understanding of um, that physical literacy and health and mental health. I, and I think that's what inspired me to continue that journey. And I think um, as part of my own journey, being able to actually tell my story and tell the story of some of the challenges that I've had in the diversity and inclusion space, that's been a more recent um, chapter, I guess, in, in my life. And something that I originally hadn't planned on, on doing. And then it was just a, an, an inspiration, I guess, from a trip to Chicago and meeting Arshay Cooper and looking at just how much his sharing of his story had such a massive impact and a massive ripple effect in the sport community outside of the typical heroes that we hear about in sport, his was a, a different sort of journey. And that was kind of the impetus, I think, for me to, to be in this space where I am today. And I, I'm really grateful to be here with these panelists. Yeah. We're so privileged to have you. And you mentioned Arshay Cooper. And so we'll make sure that these kind of links are captured. This is recorded and we post it on our website. And we always have a few links uh, when we share the recording as well. So we'll we'll reference that so people can explore a little more. And Andrea, you ready? Sure, Andrea came off mute, but I'll, I'll jump in since you called on me and then we'll go to the other coast. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I grew up with such an incredible opportunity in a mountain town in BC where we had seasons and kind of naturally had the multi-sport opportunities in their appropriate seasons from the get-go and you know, I came from a family that didn't have a lot, but my parents always prioritized physical activity and sport opportunities. And um, I, I mean, I loved being out there. I loved the play, the fun, the community and the connection that came from those sport experiences. And as I moved into university, uh, did a recreation management degree and have just been drawn to kind of the recreation and sport space despite sort of having a number of trajectories throughout that and um, as I started to do more and more of that work recognizing that you know not everyone had those opportunities that I'd had and how do we start to bridge some of those gaps and so started kind of early in my career in the gender equity space thanks to some great leaders um, in that space here in BC and then supporting into moving into the disability space where I spent 10 years on the Paralympic Committee Board of Directors and uh, learned so much and then started to be able to work in the Indigenous inclusion space, newcomers and throughout all of that just kept realizing we share a lot of common barriers and there's some fundamental um, pieces in how our society is structured that have created those and so how do we start to recognize dismantle and build new ways forward to make paths for each person to participate in the ways that they want and 
ultimately deserve to. So um, that continues to fuel me, although I do diversity and inclusion work across a number of um, sectors and spaces, sport keeps drawing me back in and uh, look to contribute there whenever I can. Thank goodness. Excellent. Thank you. And Andrew, great to see you again. Awesome. First off, thank you for having me today, Dr. J. Um, truly an honor to be part of this group. Um, in terms of sport, um, sport has always been part of my life for as far back as I can remember. Um, what draws me back into sport has changed over the years, but like I said, it's always been a part of my life. Um, of course, it always starts from an area of fun and definitely an outlet for my competitiveness. Growing up in um, PEI, I was the, we were the only black family in town. So sport really provided a vehicle for me just to be another, just to be a regular kid where I was Andrew the curl or Andrew the soccer player instead of Andrew the, the black kid in class. And then of course, as I left PEI and started a family, um, Sport really provided a unique link to really um, help our family bond a bit more. So that's sort of as I grew into my role as a coach and then through just a bunch of different opportunities, including some people who are joining us in this presentation today, I was able to then find sport as, as a career. And then over the last um, really two years, really since the pandemic, I've really been able to find my voice through sport and really how can I ignite change through sport and really how is it that we can make sport accessible to all so that that little indigenous girl from the Millbrook First Nation has the exact same sport experience as the little boy who lives in Halifax. So I'm very thankful for everything that sport has brought me and that it continues to bring towards me. Thank you, Andrew. And working with you and watching your leadership journey has been such a privilege. Uh, you've really, really emphasized accessibility and the importance of EDIA or JEDIA, right? With the, all the letters in there. But I really think uh, that is one of those, those linchpins for us. All right. So I wanted just to kick off by asking, and again, it can go around or people can weigh in as you wish to join. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what do you mean by inclusivity, equity, diversity, accessibility? What do these terms really mean to you? Uh, how are you using them and the work that you're doing? Uh, what do you think, where does it start? You know, we have all of these concepts and of course they hinge on each other, but but what does uh, what do you tend to focus on or, or represent in the work that you're doing? Go ahead, Andrew. So in the work that I'm doing, I think what we um what I really try to do is to demystify those words. We understand, especially based on what we see um, in general media and on social media, we have an understanding of what those words mean, but that understanding is not always correct. And I think we often lose focus that they're all intertwined. So for example, just because a sport has diversity doesn't necessarily mean that they're inclusive and so on and so forth. So I really try to explain how those are linked and also trying to um, have a base level for education. So rather than to dive into very specific topics all through sport and how it relates to um, this EDIA sector, really trying to create a level of education and create that base level of education. So we're talking about very basic things like, such as what is bias and what is privilege and how the two of them are interconnected. What is intersectionality? Really providing that base level of knowledge so that when our coaches especially go out into their field of play and just for a play, that they can truly start to take steps in their journey to making that sport more inclusive that I spoke about there a moment ago. Thank you. I can jump into this one. I feel like I spend a lot of time uh, in these explanations and I appreciate Andrew's comment that uh, they sort of all get jumbled together and sometimes people feel like they know what they mean but maybe haven't actually had time to dissect it and really consider it um, in a thoughtful way. So we very simply use um, sort of the thinking that diversity is about who you are, 
Inclusion is about what you need to be successful in those environments. Equity ties into that in that it's about individual supports and essentially figuring out what each person individually needs to be successful. Um, access is about the, creating sort of the pathways for folks to um, uh, enter and stay in those spaces. And uh, we also tie belonging into that in terms of belonging being about uh, how you feel if those pieces come together well for you so you feel supported, welcomed, and can be who you are in those spaces and places. Yeah, I love that addition. Beautiful. And Kvet? I'm new to discussing those terms in, in this space, but I think like every new thing, you, you're almost learning a new language. It's like stepping into a boathouse and you don't have the language to understand what a rigor is and, you know, where the bow is and where the stern is. And so I think um, from that perspective, if, if we look at it as a, as a kind of a language and a toolkit, um, I think we, we can go, we can as leaders help people to feel more comfortable in this space by allowing them to, to learn and be open to ask questions. And I know for me, it was really important when I stepped into the rowing space, you know, I was initially a, a track and field athlete and that was something that was, um, you know, very accessible to everyone. And then, and there was a lot of representation in terms of track and field when I was growing up. So there was a lot of people that I could see when I went to track meets in other cities that looked like me. And, and, and I think from my perspective, um, that representation piece is also important. It helps tie it all together for people that if you see people that look like you, or you understand that they have a similar story as you, that helps you to understand how it's a it's a way in. It's a way in. It's a, it gives people something to aspire to. So I think um, from my perspective, I just try to share my story, um, share that representation does matter in the diversity and inclusion space. Excellent. And we know as well, when we talk about women in sport, that's uh, come up in the chat already. And I know that's your wheelhouse, Ghislaine. So passing it over to you, the importance of representation and, and your definition or understanding or use of the terms inclusion, diversity, equity, just mm. accessibility. <laughs> so I have to be careful because every time you you invite Quebec, I, I hear Quebec. So I have to say, okay, it's not me. She's calling. <laughs> so, I just, so I'll make sure that I'll wait for Guylaine instead of Quebec or Quebec. Anyway, uh, I, I think for me, it's it's really around like, and, and we have, you have all mentioned that, that the piece around uh, it's really about the quality of experience. So when we think about diversity, it's just not the question of you tick the box and then you're good to go. Oh yes, you know I have uh, you know three women on my board, I'm good. But what are the quality of experience? What are you know are you listening to their voices? And so, so for me, it's just not having diversity, like you said uh, very well, Andrea. It's just like diversity is one thing, but inclusion is is something else. And I think that as when you are part of a privileged group, it's really hard really to understand. Uh, of course, you cannot feel what it is. So in, in, my, in my teaching, what I, I, I try to do is to find uh, a space where the students feel that they have been uh, discriminated against uh, in a larger sense, like they feel that it was not, you know, it was, uh, that was unfair, this, you know, this, that was not fair to me or, so when I, I tackle that uh, EDI stuff coming from their own personal experience when, where they felt it was unfair, then when I bring in, you know, the other issues that imagine like you are in a privileged group, but most of my students are white. So I, Quebec City is quite white. Uh, I, I do have some students from diversity, but uh, it's, a, it's a very, very low number, definitely. <clears throat> so they, they, they don't really understand, but when I use that personal experience so they can feel at least from their point of view, okay, how do you feel when it's, you have a situation that this is so not fair? Well, okay, so multiply it by 
I don't know, uh, 10 times, 20 times, whatever. So for me, the, the personal aspect is really critical when we talk about ADI, because sometimes people just feel like they've done their job because, oh, yes, you know, we have diversity. Okay, but it's a lot more than just having, you know, ticking the box. For me, that picture I see and I hear that all the time from sport leaders who feel like they have done their job now that they do have, you know, a woman of color or, you know, a, a man with a disability sitting at the table. So they're good. Um, so really for me, it's around the, the notion of the personal experience, the quality of experience, and, and really understand what does it mean to be part of a privileged group and, and, uh, and you don't, <laughs> I mean, you don't need to feel sorry about that or say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm white. That's not the case. That, you know, that's not the point. But I think this is, this is part of the, uh, how I see DI to, to make sure that people will embrace it and, and try to make change eventually. But yeah, I'll stop there. University okay. professor, you know. <laughs> So great, great to have you here. Um, yes, I love that idea too of just deep reflection, right, on your current state, your own experiences, trying to make those connections, having compassion with bias because it's there and we can't necessarily apologize it away. Uh, but we need to lean in and really understand. This is all reminding me too of the we're talking more and more about psychological safety. Andrew and I have had lots of those conversations, but that idea of being safe to be yourself, this safe to learn something, try and take risks, safe mm -hmm. to actually contribute, like Elaine's saying, and then to challenge the status quo and challenge yourself. Love it. Uh, I'd like to, any more comments on that? They want to build on each other's comments about representation or access. Those concepts, belonging, have also been woven in. I just wanted to layer on the piece around the safety because I think that's a, a topic that uh, keeps coming up right now and um, I think we need to have both safety and bravery and so when we think about safe spaces it's thinking about how those spaces are kind of non-judgmental and so people can show up and speak and um, be able to be themselves and then we have brave spaces and brave spaces is more around how you encourage some conflict and dialogue and I think we need a combination of the two in order to move this work forward because we have to work through some really hard topics and you're not going to be able to do that if we don't sort of facilitate the opportunities for people to share their voices and to do some perspective taking as we move through this to understand each other and appreciate where each other's coming from and find new ways forward. We've listened to the same voices and the same perspectives really for far too long. And that's how our world has been built and structured as sort of based on one somewhat, well, very homogeneous group. And so now we're at this point in time where we need to shift that. And that's gonna require some really brave conversations. And I love that. Thank you, Andrea, because that links very beautifully to Ghislaine's quality of the experience. Love how you're giving very practical uh, guidance on in terms of intentionality, facilitation, actually creating the avenues to invite, but also to share, right? And that's going to contribute to the brave and the safe. Andrew. Um, just a couple of things to build on that. One of the things that we talk about often, especially since I deal with coaches, is along the lines of getting comfortable to be uncomfortable. Because when we look at coach and its core, what you're doing with your athletes is you're asking them to step outside their comfort zone so that they become a better athlete. But yet as coaches, we don't focus so much on that from a personal development perspective. And I think the second thing, or at least what I'm trying to push here on the East Coast, is that when we look at safe sport, we really focus on the absence of physical harm. Yes, there's some pieces where we talk about um, the mental side thing, but we don't necessarily look at it from a racial or discriminatory point of view. Like at the end of the day, we need to start looking like at, for example, the example with the goal from the Halifax Hawks and PEI. Now, when we look at that, we need to look at it from the perspective of when those racial slurs are being hurled towards him, that that's no different than if there was a physical safety environment. Perhaps somebody comes in with a weapon, for example. That's what it is. We need to be able to create that safe space because at the end of the day, if the little Muslim girl goes to the soccer field and is asked to remove her hijab, 
that's just as much a safe sport thing as it is a racial and discriminatory thing. And I think it's really just similar to Guillen, not you don't need to apologize for the privilege that you have or have not. It's a matter of really changing our mindset around this and really looking at it from what we're just simply trying to do is make sure that sport is inclusive for all. Thank you. Great, you always have such good examples, Andrew. Thank you, it helps us formulate and Quebec. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to share my perspective coming from that high performance culture in, in rowing. And what I found really, it was a, a very significant transition moving from being a varsity athlete. And I had a ton of fun. We were a very competitive varsity crew. We actually had five women that went from the varsity crew onto the Canadian national team. So we had developed a really good culture around pushing each other and performance and competition. But stepping into that high performance boat house, I think there was a lot more, you know, when we discussed safety, that wasn't something that was discussed back when I, when I, when I was rowing. And a lot of the culture around rowing was, you know, it, it deviated from looking at what any individual, one person's individual needs were and looking at um, kind of that goal of performance being the top the pinnacle. And, um, you know, there was always that growth within that. But when the athlete is not the center, when the outcome is the center, I think it makes for a, you know, a very highly charged and more risky environment. And when you're a person of color in a predominantly white, predominantly privileged sport, um, and for me, I had that kind of combination of being female, being a person of color and coming from a poor socioeconomic background. So you have very few choices and, and you, but you want to be in that space, but the risk of speaking up just feels like your life is on the line. It's not just your seat on the boat, it's your opportunity, it's your um, you know, financial stability. There were so many other layers to it that I think from a, and people that weren't experiencing what I was experiencing, they might, have, they might not have seen those additional pressures. You know, once I got my hands on the oar and I was in the boat, I always felt that it was a level playing field once we were on the water, but just to actually get into that position there were so many layers of um, kind of stress and additional barriers that you're kind of shouldering to just get to that start line. So um, that was just one piece from, from that perspective. Beautiful. And I'm seeing comments in the chat too, just really thank you for the share and totally relate. Um, I think it also talks, that leads us to thinking about access. It's not just about people at the table are opening the door, right? It's about that quality and how do we invite and make it inviting and, and safe, but also, you know, intentionally involve people so they feel like they're, they belong and they're included and, and important in the space. Andrea. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Cause um, I, I think the point around our performance system and how we've shaped that around really commodifying athletes rather than putting athletes at the center and focusing on what that experience is and from an equity standpoint, what they need to be successful and how we make sure that our job is actually to facilitate that rather than facilitating a performance because the performance will come if you take care of people, but along the way we seem to have forgotten to take care of people. Right. And we do have lots of examples of that. Right. But yeah, that's so that's now leading us into talking about the, the role of sport. But also let's talk about in sport for a little while. You know, what are we experiencing? We're seeing a bit in the chat about that as well. What are we experiencing right now within sport? Some of the challenges, the opportunities. What are some models that look great in your mind? Uh, important elements that need to be either tackled or introduced or, are you know, elevated and amplified within sport um uh, if i can start for me the 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 biggest challenge right now, and i think it's for the entire canadian community and 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 sport is no different is that more and more how i feel um we are very polarized and it's 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 more and more difficult uh, to build bridges 
between people uh, and, and to build that communication bridge, if I can call it that way. Uh, and because everything starts with a good communication. Like if you don't communicate, how can you, you know, make changes? How can you understand the other? And because of that polarization, um, I, I feel I, I'm I'm really uh, super optimistic at the moment. Uh, and, and how how can we make sure that those bridge will stay there? Because without that, how can we make sure that we will build that? you know, inclusive sport environment. And um, so for me, it's, that's a real challenge to, to see, uh, uh, like when you, you hear people that don't, they don't believe in research anymore. And for me, research was such a key element, you know, an eye opener to see that it's just that me who think there's a problem, look like we had only 10 women coaches in Beijing. And, and five of them were in figure skating. So in, out of 85 coaches. So I do believe in research. I'm a researcher. And for me, it was always a great lever to, to open eyes and see this is, you know, this is the facts. So we need to act on those. And when you feel like this message is, is not, you know, it's, it's shaky right now. It's, it's people are challenging that or just don't throw it away and say, now, nah, you know, that's bullshit. So for me, it's, it's, it's scary because I think for all the, the, the minority groups, the groups that are have been discriminated against for years and are still are in the sport world. Um, so we need to be very, very careful to make sure that, like we, I think we feel like we are on the slippery road now. And and I think, uh, like from a privileged standpoint, I, I feel the obligation to speak up and to make sure that I, I will keep pushing and and bringing research in and and keep working uh, to, to make the changes happen. But uh, for me, that's, that's one really one of the biggest challenge I feel right now, uh, not only in sport, but in Canada in general, um, but in sport, it's, it's happening as well. Like I'm working on trans inclusion right now. Oh my God, like I have a big target on me. It's just like, it's, Unbelievable. So that's an example, but for me, it's it's scary. And each, I'm so glad you referenced communication since we are in the communication. We're kind of hitching our start of that wagon today, but uh, of course, right? And that's definitely where I come from. But and communication is also contributing to that polar polarization, right? With, with the freedom we have to voice our concerns and our judgments, and there's a lot of blaming going on. But at the same time, we can also leverage it through sharing data, sharing, I mean, you think about the athlete can, uh, the big, the big uh, study that they did of a thousand athletes really highlighting how prevalent uh, abuse was in sport, harm was in sport in all different layers. And it, it amplified the psychological abuse that people experience through sport. So research, you know, we think of it as this boring thing that we're doing, but the data is so valuable in getting that truth out there. So critical. We know that. And what else, what else needs to be brought into the space that will help? I, I know I've never thought I'd love policy, but man, do I love policy right now as well. And how do we sustain change? That's the other question that Gillian, uh, Quebec, go ahead and then Andrew. And I, I think it's a good opportunity now because so many pe people have experienced similar barriers to access in sport over the pandemic. And I think for a lot of people, especially like me that have children, you realize just how important that foundation of sport is in their lives. And I think it's a it's kind of a real world example that we can all relate to at the moment and not having that access to our teams and our sports and the joy of coming together for a game and participating, I think is you know, it's possibly one opportunity that we can bridge that gap to say, how did you feel when, you know, you you couldn't go out, you couldn't be part of that team for month after month after month. And I know there's a lot of children that that 
felt very sad. You know, that's the best part of their day. For my kids, they would go to running practice and just want to continue on. You know, they'd stay long after the practice was over just to chat with their friends because they weren't going to school and they weren't having those opportunities to connect in other ways. So I think it has highlighted some of those things that we took for granted with sport um, in terms of bringing us together. So I think that's kind of an opportunity to leverage a, a, a similar connection in terms of experience experience because um, it's 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 been an, a barrier to access that we've all experienced. And I think the other thing that I find, um, it can be a positive, it can also be a negative in terms of communication is social media. You know, the, there's an opportunity to see different people doing different things all over the world. And perhaps, you know, um, you see on social media, there's a small group of, I, I know one that I found was black girls rowing. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole site and what they do is they just share like really inspiring content and it's it's in, it's based out of the US but you know it's a way that people if they're in PEI like Andrew or they're in small town rural Ontario you know it's a way that they can connect with other people that are doing similar things and sort of cheer them on so i think um that's one way that communication can help, you know, if we want to look at the flip side to, to a positive, <laughs> positive development. And Andrew. Um, for myself, it's threefold. So similar to the end, um, the amount of vitriol that exists on social media is truly surprising to me. And I think one of the things that's us, and this is another conversation for another time, is how to properly have a conversation with somebody or how to not debate somebody, but the fact that if Andrew, just as an example, expresses her opinion, if I disagree with it, I don't need to immediately go to, well, your opinion is stupid, Andrew. Like, there's levels in between that where you can have a conversation and quite frankly at the end of the day with certain things you can agree to disagree but that seems to be gone I mean the amount of of dms that I get that are just unbelievably racist and whatnot even when speaking to my own personal story it's quite unbelievable but um I think this second part too and the second and third sort of link together is for more sports, regardless of if it's at the community, provincial, or national level, to understand that diversity does not necessarily equate to inclusion. So just because your sport is diverse does not mean that you're inclusive. You know, in just doing a search um, regionally to the number of provincial sport organizations that have a inclusion policy, just as an example, there are very few. There's many sports that made the statement that everybody is welcome or we take discrimination seriously. But in terms of an actual inclusion policy, those that's just completely missing altogether. Mm -hmm. And then the third part is um, just the pandemic, right? So we need to recognize that I don't need this necessarily to be everybody's top priority. But at the same time, as we're coming out of the pandemic, knock on wood, um, that you you look at these things from an equity, diversity, and inclusion perspective. I'm not asking to completely rewrite things overnight, but as you're creating that tournament, as you're as a coach, as you're creating your practice, your sport environment, is this as inclusive as it could be? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I need you to wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt or an orange t-shirt or anything like that. But what I do need you to do, again, I. And I try to hand this point home. Again, that little indigenous girl doesn't have the same experience as that little boy who, who is privileged. And at the end of the day, we need to be, as a society, we need to first off accept the fact that regardless of your background, regardless of your culture, that's not okay. And we don't need to make it completely equal overnight, but we really need to close that gap. And that's sort of the point where I start from every single day in this job. Wonderful. And so understanding, I love that, the metaphor of the bridge, because let's understand why the gap exists. What are the size? What are these polarities? 
uh, bring them closer together with greater understanding. We can do that through research and conversation. You've given us a great tool about, I have literally three pairs of readers on my desk right now. <laughs> Why? They're all over the house. But I often think of the lenses, you know, through each of these lenses. That's a great tool for coaches, administrators, leaders in sport to remember, just to start looking at things a little bit differently. And uh, there was also something in the chat earlier about belief systems. And so it's not just... Um, the, the sort of obvious topics we tend to grapple with, but also being open to differences of perspectives. And sport can teach us how to do that very well. I mean, God, Quebec and I know, trying to function with nine, eight other women in, a, in an eight, right? And bring all those very fierce personalities together and come to an agreement, you really need some great tools to be able to do that. And I think that applies to any team, whether it's a soccer team or, you know, a single cyclist with a team behind them that's in, in support and guiding. And you're a team with your coach too. Wonderful. Andrea. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Andrew, I just want to acknowledge your experience that you shared and thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry that that's been the experience you've had in receiving that uh, those hateful messages. One of the things I wanted to build on that I said earlier around brave spaces is uh, encouraging respectful conflict and dialogue, I think is an important word that I missed in that description. So I think that is a piece that we're really missing right now and that people are kind of leaping to uh, extremes rather than starting with kind of how, to, how can you figure this out and share things in a respectful way. I wanted to tie back to part of your original question, Jen, around um, what do you know? What do we want to see? What do we need more of it uh, in the programming and sport uh, delivery? And so, I wanted to share a couple of examples of some of the work that we've been doing here in Victoria, which have been around looking at girls-specific programming and creating equity-based programs. And then we've just done the same um, with a para program to create more of a disability inclusion, recognizing that both of those groups, as well as many others, have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and already had limited access to begin with. And so what we did with um, para, uh, Power Play, which is the name of the girls program, is we um, specifically targeted with kids sport some funding to put together a girls only program for ages six to nine knowing that sort of those are key ages for girls to develop movement skills and confidence so they stay in sport and we've introduced them to a number of different sports so it's a multi-sport program and we offer it on a season basis and it's free registration targeted at girls whose families qualify for kids sport funding, so lower income families. And we also work with them to understand what are their equipment needs, what are their transportation needs, are there any other barriers they're facing to that participation, and then create a really safe, fun, engaging environment where they move from sport to sport over a series of weeks. So they sort of get about three to four weeks of each sport as an introduction. And then we've done a very thorough evaluation of it as well to understand what that experience looks like and how that's translating to them wanting to stay in that sport. And we've had some really great success seeing girls who tried hockey a year ago, who then went into an intro hockey program and have now joined a hockey league as one example of that. And on the uh, Parasport one, we just started it in January, but a similar model, older age group, introductory to sport, multi-sport program, seven sports over 20 weeks. And uh, again, free registration, looking at all of the different barriers they might be facing, providing all the equipment, and just trying to create something that will really be supportive of that introduction or reintroduction to sport experience. The last piece I wanted to add on that was thinking about sort of as we go forward in sport, um, how do we co-create some of these programs? So I feel like a lot of our sports system has sort of been built on, you know, um, let's call it that homogenous group making decisions and sort of saying, this is what we're going to do. And we've done it for um, different populations. And we have this opportunity now to really think about how do we do it? with and by the populations that we actually want to impact so they're the ones informing how we go forward um, and i'm going to throw out a little bit of a scary word here and sort of step away from what has been a really white supremacy based culture and think about how we need to break that apart understand what some of the roots of that are 
and start to create with the communities and by the communities that we um, know that haven't been part of it. Thank you, Andrew, or Andrea, sorry, I'm looking at Andrew's name here. Thank you, Andrea. And you can see a lot of support happening in the chat as well, commentary on shared experiences and, and how uh, rough it really is, it can be out there. This idea of uh, opportunities, challenges that we're facing within sport, it'd be wonderful to hear a little bit more on uh, what your perspective is on that. What are some of the barriers we're still facing within sport, challenges, opportunities? Quebec? Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of connect some of those challenges to what you were just speaking about in terms of barriers to access and and uh, even tying in my experience with Arshay Cooper, who I mentioned before. Um, it was back in 2019, I met Arshay in Chicago, and he was filming the documentary A Most Beautiful Thing, which is a rowing documentary, but it's also a documentary about his experience as one of the members of the first all black high school rowing team. And he uses that documentary as an excellent message in terms of overcoming the challenges of being a young black man in inner city Chicago and all of the barriers that he had just to life, let alone to sport and how rowing was really such a beautiful part of his life. And so we went as a family in 2019 to Chicago and my husband's company was all, already working on on um, uh, like locally and internationally on accessibility to rowing. And, and so they donated equipment to, um, to, the, to the project and being able to see what they were doing in that space and how they really have shaken up. When you talk about shaking up um, the, the culture and, and the sporting world, that I think he was really doing that. And um, the culminating scene we were able to, to watch and the culminating scene of that film is when they um, come together with the Chicago police and they all get in the boat and they row together. And it was just a very powerful thing to witness. And following on from that, um, that was kind of my inspiration to step into these different projects and different um, things that were happening here in Canada, but looking at that model of what's, what are, what are the entry points to rowing? How can youth be um, inspired? How can you create more access and, and openness to that? And Row Ontario was just starting a diversity and inclusion committee in 2020. So the, the following year. So I got involved with that through, um, through the University of Toronto um, Alumni Association. And I and there's so many opportunities, I think, when you look at grassroots community connections and leveraging the connections and supports and um, the a most beautiful thing inclusion fund, that's what they're doing. They're bringing together um, schools and teachers, providing coaching training. They're looking at um, education and sport as an opportunity to kind of bring together the community, but also elevate youth within the sport. And I think it's also happening here in Canada. You know, Row Ontario has some strategies, Rowing Canada has some strategies. And when you can branch out, not just from focusing on that high performance model to focusing on the entry of entry to sport and to um, sport as a vehicle for education and sport through the lifespan, I think it's a really um, powerful, powerful tool. And when you connect community organizations, so you actually, um, you tie into existing supports that are there. And one example that I had from this past summer was STEM to Stern, which is a youth boat, boat building, an existing, yeah, youth, youth boat building. And I know that um, Jennifer knows uh, David Vine, who is part of STEM to Stern. And uh, he reached out and he reached out after watching the premiere of A Most Beautiful Thing. And uh, and we did the launch and the first launch in 2020. Um, and what they do is they take youth from the community. So we did the launch in Tilsonburg and they take youth from the community and they did it at the youth community center, um, typically at risk youth. And they spend a week building a boat. So using hand tools to build a boat. And then down at the rowing club, they launch the boat. And it's just really special to see them not only learning the STEM education, um, getting their hands on in a skilled trade, and then feeling that achievement of having a, 
a community launch event where they're featured and they're able to experience rowing in that in in the boat. And I think it was a, a very special experience for me to witness from a community standpoint. Wonderful. The whole time you were talking, I was thinking, trying to remember the his first name because I remember his name. Last David. Time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll definitely post that link as well. Uh, we've got lots of things uh, mentioned here. And I also wanted to harken back to a comment Andrew made about the, the COVID and how it's amplified. Uh, and Quebec was talking about this too, you know, never waste a good crisis. That was Ram, Ram Emmanuel, I think, from Chicago. So that's interesting, the links, all these wonderful links. And um, back to Andrea's point too about access being being about pathways, but then we're also seeing this need for supports and, and that's echoed again in the chat by a wonderful comment by Sophie. Thank you. And Andrew, you've had your mic on for a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, um, first off, I absolutely love um, the comments that are in the chat. So please, by all means, keep them coming. Mm -hmm. um, I think a few important points, or if there's one message that I can give in this, I forget my name or what I look like or whatnot, is to remember that number one, you don't need to do this alone. Um, is similar to what Quebec said. There are organizations that already work with these groups that we um, target as historically marginalized communities that you can partner with so that you're not necessarily starting from square zero because creating trust within these communities that you're trying to work with is extremely important. And I think the second part too is focus first on creating a quality sport program and not a program that's sustainable. And what I mean by that is historically in some of the work that I've done inside this role is I want any program that I do, I want that to be led and have feedback from the community that I'm working with. Because at the end of the day, what tends to happen, at least here on the East Coast, is sport organization XYZ acknowledges this problem. There's a lack of diversity within their sport. Then sport XYZ gets a truckload of money because right now EDI and sport, it's very attractive. So the funds right now, they're not hard to come by. So then they take 10,000, 20,000, the amount doesn't matter, amount of equipment, plot that into a community. So for the sake of our example, we use East Preston, which is a predominantly black community here in Nova Scotia. And they say, we want to create a hockey program, a soccer program, a football, whatever that sport is, it doesn't really matter. And now go do it. We're not recognizing that you need to communicate with sport in order to have a program that works. So for example, with the Black Rock Initiative, which is a not-for-profit that I run specifically related to curling, we asked the question, what does curling look like within your community? And the first answer that we got back working with um, a local boys and girls club was that, Curling is a sport for rich old white people. So rather than arguing that point, we accepted the fact that this is the reality that we are working. This is the perception of the community. This is what we need to work with. We need to work to in order to eliminate those barriers. And then one by one, we started to eliminate barriers based on the feedback the community was given us. And that's true no matter what the sport. And you present an opportunity, preferably within the community, to try that sport. And then if the facility is outside the community, similar to curling, then, then invite them to that sport. Because if, what, if you invite them to the curling club right away, they will say, this isn't a sport for me. I, I look on TV and I don't see anybody who looks like me. Why would I try this sport? But going back to that point of developing trust and developing that relationship, create a program that, that a quality sport program that the community sees themselves in and then worry about sustainability afterwards. I apologize, I can get off on a, on a tangent with this and speak for hours, but that's sort of the big point. And we find that there are some sports here locally who are trying that model and seeing similar success levels as well. It'd be great to hear an example or two if you're if you're Sure, ready. so um, the Black Youth Ice Hockey Program that's run by Hockey Nova Scotia, this is a model that they've operated on for, I want to say close to 15 years where they created a sport program based on the needs of the community, based on the barriers. And now it's grown into, it's a, it's a program that's run by the black community for the black community. Similar to as well, 
um, shameless plug with the Black Rock Initiative, our mission is to get more BIPOC youth into the sport of curling. We've done a similar model where we were still small, but we had 32 participants across three different targeted demographics. And out of those participants, we had a third of them sign up to be part of the local junior program. And that was in both programs are in part because they recognize the needs of community, address those barriers accordingly, and then put that, put that into action. So those are just a couple of, of examples off the top of my head. I, I know soccer in Nova Scotia is starting similar work, so we expect to see very similar things come out of that as well. Great, and other, other initiatives or uh, strategies that you see working to achieve a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, safe, but also brave? What are some other strategies that you're, you're either leading or that you're noticing? That's helping. Go ahead, Andrea. And then uh, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, we're, our company, Inclusion Incorporated, is working with local, provincial, national or, uh, sport organizations on a variety of different projects. I would say the piece that um, I'm strongly encouraging is that we look at what the strategy is for that work. And what we saw at the beginning of, um, I'll call it the social justice movement, was that you know, people struck DEI committees or they were sort of like, oh, we need to fix this problem. And they weren't necessarily taking it in terms of long-term thinking. And this has been, this problems have been created over generations. So it's going to take time and intention and um, very thoughtful approaches to move it forward and to shift how things have been done. And uh, so what we work to do with organizations is to look at what is their current state. So understanding where they are now with data-driven approaches, looking at what their current policies are and how those are helping or hindering them in moving forward. And then working with them on strategy and action plans so that they develop a long-term plan to approach this work. And then out of that long-term plan, they have some specific actions and timeframes attached, as well as accountabilities, which is a crucial part of this work, um, so that they know where they're going and how they're going to track out on that success over time. And then continuing to use those data points, those benchmarks to track out over um, how they progress um, as they move forward. And so I think it's really important to think about it in terms of you know, where are you today? Where do you want to be? And what are those steps you're going to need to get there? And nobody can do this alone to the point Andrew just made, like we're better together. And we've been, you know, strongly encouraging organizations to work together on this, whether it's an NSO bringing their PSOs into the work, um, whether it's sports coming together to co-create steps forward. We know that we operate in a really siloed system in our sport system. And our funding mechanisms continue to perpetuate that. And so I think we have to find ways to encourage people to work together. And that's not always going to be easy and it's probably going to take longer, but ultimately it's crucial if we want to be successful in this work. Love that. Love that concept of incentivizing it, right? There's, there's value in working together, of course, as we know through support. And you're also really talking in the, in the, uh, communication students in the audience will appreciate this cultural auditing that you do, looking at where, where are the gaps. We say we value this, but then it shows up in these other contradictory ways. And so doing that kind of work is so essential. And, and we can all have those cultural auditing lenses on as well. We say we value, but then we do something that actually mm -hmm. communicates uh, an opposite value. Yeah. Well, and the other piece of it is um, I really struggle with, you know, we've sort of gone this down this path of safe sport and now we're going down this path of DEI. And to me, and this was came up earlier in the conversation, I think from Andrew, they're really connected and we're not recognizing that in the ways we need to yet, because there are safe sport issues that come up on a daily basis through discrimination and harassment that really were not on the radar when we started these safe sport conversations a few years ago. And, you know, we've been focusing on some of the worst incidences of safe sport 
but there's this continuum of it and the continuum directly connects to people's identities and to that psychological safety in those spaces. So we need to do a bit of a rethink in that and start to really intentionally connect that if we want to make some changes in these spaces. Love that. And that links back to An Andrew's point about harm, you know, what harm really is, which forces us to question um, those, yeah, question how to how to balance power, which is what all of this has to do with really, doesn't it? How to understand how we, we can be equitable in our appreciation for uh, all the unique human beings in our world. And it's possible. It's absolutely possible having a partnership model. Okay, Gilam is up next and then Kubet. Thank you. Kilian. Uh Well, I think just to uh, to follow up a bit on Kubet is the, you know, I think that the burden should, should not be on the shoulders of the minority groups and those who, so we should be, when you are in a power position, you're the one who should speak up. And, and uh, it's like woman's issue, like it's not a woman's issue, you know, it's a social issue, it's a sport issue. It's just so, so it's not a black issue. It's a, so, and I think that we need to, to understand that. And it's not always <clears throat> to those who are struggling that to have to fight again and, you know, feel like they're alone, that they don't have the support, the resource, so on and so forth. So for me, that piece is, is really critical. Um, it, Talking about different um, uh, initiatives, uh, Egal Action is the Quebec Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport, and uh, we have uh, developed different workshops and uh, and two in particular that we that are <laughs> one is very popular is that we you know that most girls are coached by men, and um, and they want to do a good job, but sometimes they just don't get it, and they would come to us and say, okay. Can you help me? Because it's not working. Like it's just not working. So they come in coaching. They have their male experience, a male athletes experience, and they they just you know copy and paste what they've experienced as an athlete. And and then they are in front of twelve adolescent girls, and they they struggle. So we have designed that workshop for male coaches about okay, who is the girl who is coming into your gym? So to understand her and our rationale behind that is that we wanna make sure that the girls will have a, a positive experience in sport. So they will stay in sport. And, um, and, and that, so that workshop is so popular. Like it's the most, it's always, always. And um, so eventually we hope that we won't need those kind of workshop, but at the moment, you know, girls and boys are not socialized the same way still. There are quite some, uh, you know, you go to Walmart and you know the girls' toys where they are. It's still pretty pink and princess stuff versus the warrior and all that stuff. So anyway, so that that one was was designed to make sure that at the end of the day, the girls will have a great experience in sport and they will stay in sport. So if we thought that if the coaches, the male coaches would, and, and they want to know, they want to learn. They It's just that they were, you know, they felt like they, they didn't know how to, to do that. So that one is, is an example. Um, and the other one is we started a program called uh, Active Mentor, Mentor Active, and it was to develop leadership skills for adolescent girls uh, within school and uh, to make sure that uh, girls would take in charge their own uh, sport practice and physical activity. They would organize themselves and pick the sports, the activities that they like to do and, and making sure that because it's within their own environment, then if you are in a rural uh, you know, environment, then you can maybe work outside and enjoy outdoor activities, whether you are in a city center in, in Montreal, then you don't have the same. So instead of having a one size fits all program, so we, we help the girls, the adolescent to design their own experience in sport and and so that was again uh so the what happened is that the uh the adolescent on grade 11 12 were the mentors of the younger one within the school and to help them to organize so it was just uh so when you are in uh, grade eight then you know that when you'll get in grade 11, you will be the mentor. So it created a really nice environment within the school. And so, and one thing, one thing that we did after is that we connected with one of our indigenous community in Quebec. And uh, so we bring in our material 
but then we sat with them and they, they adapted it and we train indigenous, uh, you know, leaders, a mentor, uh, and they started to use the program on their own. Now, it's their program. They, they, it, so it's, it was all around leadership. And our hope is that actually I would love to make a research project. It will come eventually, but to see the impact because our hope is that those adolescents will maybe become coaches themselves or being involved, you know, in your sport club within the school or whatever. But so those two initiatives were, uh, are very uh, successful and, and so far having a, a great impact. And brilliantly building on what exists already, looking for partnerships that are there in your environment already, but also um, just embodying, even in your process, the concepts of equity and, and appreciation for diversity, allowing ownership, right, instead of imposing. <laughs> That's really challenging, those fundamental assumptions that Andrea was talking about underlying a lot of our, our artifacts in our culture, hey, that are driving this imperialist, paternalistic, colonial, and uh, what's who's superior. I have this slide that just lays it all out and I like to show that to different classes, but you know that's what we're operating on, this foundation, the pink and the blue, the warrior and the princess, it's, uh, it's wild. How do we pull that out? How do we expose those assumptions, tackle them through sport? What do you think? That's a big question, but Kabet, I think you might have other things to say first, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it is a that's a huge question. But I was just going to build on what uh, Ghislaine was saying and what Andrea was saying in terms of, um, you know, when you when you're reaching out to different communities and some of the pro amazing programs that you're talking about. I think really defining what success looks like, and we can impose that definition on somebody. And I, I learned as a physiotherapist, um, and it was one of my career learnings in physio, that it's much more meaningful when it's from the patient's goal, when it's what success looks like for them. They might have a frozen shoulder and you think their end outcome is that they need full range of movement in their shoulder. Well, if they want to sleep through the night and they want to be able to pick up their grandchild, you can get them full range of movement and they still haven't achieved success. So I think defining that from the beginning when you're reaching out to different groups, I think is um, it's really critical because then you can look at it at the end and you know it, it might be important to you that of that learn to row group, four or five people continue on and they stay with the club. But from their perspective, if they've never ever had the opportunity to be out on the water or to experience um, a different sport, success could be, we had a great day, we had so much fun, our families came out and they're gonna share that opportunity and that's what success looks like to them. So I think from some of the things that I've learned about what's happening here in Canada um, in, in terms of the rowing community, Community, when they're doing the outreach, I think that's a really important piece is that if you can really tap into from listening to the, the perspective of the different groups that you're working with, what does success look to, like to them? And is sport an opportunity for academic success? Is it an opportunity to expose people to groups that they might not be able to have exposure to? Is it, um, you know, there's so many different tools that you can use and so many different ways that you can define success. And one of the things that I had the opportunity to do that I thought was a really, um, it was a fun evening. It was the Young Women's Professional Dinner with Row, Row New York. And it was a, a virtual event and they invited a bunch of panelists specifically for the women that they, the young women that they were working with in that group. And they wanted a diverse range of um, people, women working in different careers. And so it was like a career night, but for the high school athletes that were part of the program and part of their definition of success was um, really rigorous academic support. So it, it was, I, I found it really interesting because there was one woman that was a, a mechanic in a BMW shop, the only woman in her shop. There was another person who was a dermatologist. So it was just an opportunity for these young women to um, speak to and hear about different stories, different challenges from other women working in different fields. And then we had different breakout groups. And, you know, although it's a career night, it was leveraged through sport and, and through that association with the rowing club. 
Okay, thank you. Other, uh, other opportunities or pathways that you're noticing strategies, initiatives in your space that you'd like to highlight or elements of those that you think are quite salient to achieving these, these goals we've been talking about today. Go ahead, Gillian. I think there's, there's one thing that I, I, I would like to share before uh, it's almost the end already. Okay. Amazing, like time flies as usual. Uh, so right now I feel like the the majority of us is very quiet and the minority is taking a lot of space, uh, especially like Andrew said in the social media in particular. Uh, and, and I think that especially when we think about diversity, inclusion, safety uh, in sport, that we need to be loud. We need to take the space to make sure that, because right now it's, it's, it's like I, I talk about the trans inclusion, um, uh, subject or things that I'm working on at the moment is, uh, and it's, it's like, you have no idea what we, what probably, you know, what, what you can find on, on, on the social media and, and elsewhere. But, and, and I think that we, we need to speak up. We need to, like the majority that is looking at that and, and thinking that it's terrible we're not reacting enough from my perspective. So I'm, this is probably one message that I, 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 need, I, I feel I need to, to share is that we are a majority. So if the majority starts speaking, we'll be louder and, and then we'll make space for, for all those group who are discriminated against uh, and who, who get those hate messages. And uh, so that, that was just my last, uh, my last piece, I guess I needed to share. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, so what's next? Oh, go ahead, Andrea. <clears throat> well, I was just going to um, layer on to Gillian's last point around sort of the majority speaking up. And there's a really great uh, quote from Christine Sue, who's based in Toronto, um, who says, the minority is the majority. And as we go forward, I think we need to really reflect on that. We've allowed our perception of who the majority is to be the same for far too long and now we have this opportunity where if we actually come together and kind of connect some of these topics and some of the I'm going to say common challenges that we're facing we can have a really loud voice so um, I just wanted to layer that in thanks Gillen. And so often in these spaces it is about looking and linking arms and recognizing you do have those supports and it is a bigger group that you're not alone can be uh, terrifying. It's my first piece of advice to anyone tackling a tough challenge is find some buddies, <laughs> hang on to each other, uh, because you'll have the confidence then to keep, keep working. I don't like using the, the fight or battle word anymore. I'm trying to use the word work and ethical, not brave so much about you're being very ethical and strong. All right. And what next? What what's your advice for, we've had lots of tools. We had some questions about what do I do for my, my program? I think you've shared quite a few concepts, tools, principles, strategies, examples that are out there. We're gonna have a whole list of resources we can share. But what do you see as, as the next thing to tackle uh, that you'd like us to focus on as a, as a community, sport community? Andrew? So I think it's twofold. Number one, before you reach out to a historically marginalized community, I think you need to ask yourself a certain amount of questions internally. So it's one thing to have um, a number of Indigenous kids or in anyone from the Indigenous community show up at your facility if they haven't been there historically. But what are you prepared to do to make that a welcoming environment? For you? Right, that goes back to the diversity is necessary. So I think there needs to be some internal work there because what I've experienced a lot is I have a number of organizations who reach out to me and say, I want your contacts with this or I want your contacts with that. And it's like, no, I think you need to do some internal work first before you get to that point. And I think the next step, just to what I mentioned earlier, is you need to take that step and reach out and get comfortable being uncomfortable. This work is not supposed to make the majority, quite frankly, this work is not supposed to make white people feel good, right? Like, 
And we need to accept that for what it is. That doesn't mean that, similar to Guiana, you're a bad person for being white, but you need to embrace that discomfort and, like I mentioned earlier, get comfortable being uncomfortable and take that first step, whatever that is. And first steps can be different for everybody. First steps can be reaching out to one of the panelists and asking a couple more questions. First steps can be having a conversation around EDI at your local, at your next board meeting. It can be different for everybody, but you really need to start to move forward. And at the end of the day, the way I look at it is every morning when I wake up, I ask myself the question of, what can I do to make sport a little bit more diverse and a little bit more equitable and a little bit more inclusive for everybody by the time I go to bed? And even if it's so very small, that's positivity in the right direction. I think we just need to, we really need to remember that you're not going to change the world overnight. Just really take those small steps and move forward in a positive manner. Thank you so much, Andrew. And that's the perfect place to finish, I think. Uh, Anna has arrived. She's going to give us a little wrap up and, and a farewell. But I think that's such a great way to, to end. I've asked just that act of asking yourself the question that day. What can I do that will contribute to, to the work that needs to be done? Beautiful. Thank you. Lots of thanks in the chat as well. Anna, I'm going to hand it over to you as the host extraordinaire. Thank awesome. you so much to the panel. Very appreciative of your time. You've spent 90 minutes with us today educating a vast group of people who are very committed and interested in these topics and how they can wake up each morning and, and enact some change in our environment. Uh, a lot of devoted people to sport, to communication, and uh, I'm loving that partnership as well, increasingly. So thank you all, and I'll be in touch afterward uh, with recording links and other things. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Walinga, Dr. J. That was incredible. Once again, I have so many notes. Thank you to everybody engaging in the chat as well. I know I mentioned at the beginning, it makes it such an engaging um, and interactive experience. And Dr. J, you are an absolute expert at weaving those questions in and pulling some of these beautiful answers out from the panelists as we went through. But a quick thank you to Christopher, Andrew, Monique, uh, Megan, who were in the chats, Chijoke, who had a wonderful validation comment as well for Cuvette. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of takeaways that I had as well from the session because I know 90 minutes is a lot and there's a lot of information, um, but I will put my glasses on for this one before we close off. Um, Andrea, we've forgotten how to take care of people. Yeah, we've forgotten how to take care of people. So what does it mean to be part of a privileged group? What are you prepared to do? How can we create safe and brave spaces um, that really acknowledge all the intersections of oppression? Cubetta point you brought forward. Um, all of these accessibility points are intersected with one another. Uh, so everyone feels like they can speak up. Goodness. Um, and Gilan, everything starts with conversation, right? Dr. Walinga, hang on to each other. These are some great takeaways. Thank you so much to the entire panel.